Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship here in uh, God's house here in Piedmont and God's house online everywhere where you happen to be watching us this morning. I am so happy and blessed to welcome you here to this place in this time of worship. I'm Don Ashburn, one of the pastors here, and Scott Kale and I and Dr. Steve Main, we're so happy to welcome you here. Um, there are a few announcements before we get started. You can turn to them in the bulletin and you'll find a lovely, or a picture of a parade, a lovely parade that, and, and actually a lovely like beauty queen or something in the, in the photo, but we are gonna be participating in the 4th of July parade this year as a church. And there's an announcement here about how you can take part in that. It's a great tradition here in Piedmont. This coming uh, Friday and Saturday, or actually, yes, July 2nd is Saturday. This coming Saturday, we're gonna be inviting people to come and help us put together the float here in the church parking lot. And then on Sunday, you can also come again and after worship, we'll go out and we'll keep working on the float together. Anybody who wants to join us of whatever age can come and help us and we'll have hot dogs and refreshments and it'll be a lot of fun. And then on uh, Monday, 4th of July, you can join us as we march together in uh, the parade and we'll have some really cool t-shirts. I don't know, Michael, uh, how many we might have because there was a little bit of a delay in the order, but we have a lot of them already. So there will be some uh, t-shirts. Also on Tuesdays, we have a Just Breathe class. That's a meditation uh, class that Sarah Hirsch and Steve Main lead here weekly in the sanctuary. And my goodness, in the times we're living in, don't you all just wanna breathe sometimes and come to a place of peace? And so that is what we are offering on Tuesdays. Uh, July 17th, upcoming is another come and see gathering where we, uh, Dr. Uh, Shipstead and myself will uh, welcome anybody who's interested in learning more about the church or learning about how to become a member of the church, come and join us at 11.15 that day. We'll, lunch will be provided. And connect cards. Uh, you'll find them in the pew racks in front of you. These are cards for those of you who are visitors. There you go. Thank you, Bob, for holding one up. For visitors to so let us know uh, with your address or whatever that you've been here and you would like, to, like us to contact you in some way, you can indicate that on in the card. And on the other side are also prayer requests. Finally, the last thing is the flowers on the altar here, the communion table, they are given in honor of all the volunteers who have been helping the Petrenko family, the Ukrainian family who our church has been sponsoring. And uh, what a blessing it's been to get to know the Petrenkovs and also to work together with all the volunteers. And Kirk and Christina back there have done so much and Bob and Judy and so many other people. So thank you on behalf of the Petrenko family. And it's nice to be reminded of that blessing. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to the prelude.
I invite you to join me in the call to worship. If you are tired, come and worship. If you are hungry, come and worship. If you are filled with joy, come and worship. If your spirit feels renewed, come and worship. Our God desires our worship, whether we have much or little to give. There is healing when we come before our God. All who are gathered here, come and worship. Come now to the time of prayer of confession. I invite you to join me. God of grace, hear our prayer. Today we confess our pride. We confess that we make judgments upon who is worthy of your mercy or our concern. We think we know who is deserving of your love or of our own. The truth is none of us are deserving, and yet you extend salvation to each of us, to every man, woman, and child upon this earth. And you call upon us to expend that same liberating, saving love to others too. So forgive us for not loving you as you have loved, and use us to bring your grace and mercy to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we know God's word to be true, and in his word he promises us that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us for that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's remember that and start with a fresh new start today. Amen. Now, I invite you to stand and greet those around you.
It's good to see you all this morning. Let's take a moment and uh, go before our Heavenly Father as we continue on in our worship. Heavenly Father, you are great and worthy of our praise. God, you are feared above all gods. For the gods of the nations are really idols next to you. God, you made the heavens. Their splendor and majesty are before you. God, your strength and beauty are ours to behold. God, we will call to all people your glory and your strength. And God, we will call to all people the glory due your name. And we will worship you with the beauty of holiness. Father, help us to fear you in a way that leaves us in awe. Help us to find delight in the commands that you've given us. And Father, we ask especially today to give us wisdom living in the world that we live in today. Father, we want to take a moment and just offer up to you in silence the names of those that are in special need of your grace and your mercy and your healing today. Father, for those that we have mentioned and lifted up to you, give us the, the wherewithal and the, the grace and the mercy that as we interact with them, we could be your hands and your feet. And we could offer tangible service and hope and healing. Father, in the world we live in today, we ask you to give us the grace to trust you. Father, in the world we live today, we ask you to help us not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you. And Father, we know your promise is that if we do that, you will make our paths straight and our decisions sound and our comments helping and healing. Father, in the times we live in today, help us not to be wise in our own eyes but help us to fear you and seek your wisdom and resist evil. Father, we trust you today and we give you glory and honor and praise. And Father, we offer to you the prayer your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the gospel lesson today is from the eighth chapter of Mark. This is one of those stories that appears in three of the four Gospels, although it, it shows up in slightly different forms. But let's listen now to God's word to all of us today from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering 
and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your word. and pray that you will open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our minds to your word and to your world this day so that we can find ourselves who we are as we ponder and answer the question for ourselves who you are. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a study came out with a bit of fanfare earlier this year. In March, the study was done by the Episcopal Church, USA, and also the public opinion research firm Ipsos, And it was called Jesus in America. There are lots of questions in there, there interesting questions, some disturbing about faith and church and perceptions of Jesus that people have, also perceptions of Christians. And one question in particular caught my eye, which is probably not surprising since I'm a pastor. The question is, how involved are you in a church or other religious community? Now remember, this is a nationwide survey, not just of the East Bay. And can you imagine, can you guess what the answer is? What percentage of people are actively involved in church? What do you think? What? 50? 20? You're not far off. 70% responded they are not involved in church or any other religious community. That includes 60% of self-identified Christians, too. Anyway, the results that got the most attention in the press and the news media, actually quite a bit at the time, were about how Christians are seen as living out our faith. And 56% of all those surveyed, including Christians, said that Christians represent little to none of the values and teachings of Jesus in their own lives. And among non-Christians, the most common words used to describe Christians, each one had more than 50% response. The most common words used to describe Christians by non-Christians were self-righteous, arrogant, judgmental, hypocritical. Yeah, not very good news, right? And I wonder how the Supreme Court decision of the other day is going to have an impact on that. Now, there were also some non-controversial and very interesting results that I want to call our attention to right now. For example, Christians alone were asked, what word or phrase would you use to describe Jesus? And the most frequent answer was, sound like, some TV game show, but anyway, the most frequent answer was Savior, followed by Son of God, Messiah, Lord, and Healer. They're all good. And that brings us to the gospel lesson, where Jesus is basically asking his disciples to give him some public opinion research results, right? They've been traveling around Galilee with Jesus to the various villages and rural areas, they'd been collecting data from how people understand who Jesus is. They heard buzz. They had heard the question come up over and over again, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And so Jesus asks them, who do people say that I am? And one data point seems to stick out more than the others. 
the crowd sees Jesus as like Elijah or like one of the other prophets in the Hebrew Bible. He's delivering a divinely inspired message of radical repentance. Or he's like his contemporary John the Baptist, whose prophetic role is basically to be a forerunner or somebody who brings people's attention to the Messiah who is going to come in the future, the one that God has anointed to bring salvation to the people of Israel. That's what other people have to say about who Jesus is. He's a prophet. And then Jesus asks his own disciples a follow-up question. This one's a bit harder to answer because it's not about public opinion research. It's getting to the core of their own commitments, their own vision. But who do you say that I am? And Peter answers right away, as Peter tends to do, you are the Messiah. And at first glance, that would seem to be the right answer. After all, in the Gospel of Mark, the very first verse <laughs> says, this is the good news about Jesus Christ. And Christ, or Christos, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. So you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. So Peter seems to see Jesus for who he really is. But we find out soon enough that he doesn't have the whole picture. In fact, it is no coincidence at all that the story we hear right before this in the Gospel of Mark is about Jesus healing a blind man. Blind man. He touches him. The blind man gets his sight back. But at first, it's really fuzzy, blurry. In fact, this is a really memorable image. The guy says, all he can see are moving blobs, uh, people that look like walking trees. And then Jesus puts his hands on his eyes a second time, a second time, and his full vision is restored. So like the blind man, Peter can only see part of who Jesus is, and that part is distorted. So Jesus proceeds to correct his vision. He tells him and the other disciples flat out that he's going to endure all sorts of suffering. He's going to die. And on the third day, he's going to be raised again from the dead to bring salvation to the earth. And to you and me as Christians living 2,000 years later, that sounds perfectly familiar. Sounds right. Yeah, that's exactly what the Christ does as far as we know. But remember, Jesus is asking this question of his disciples before any of that happens. And to Peter and the other disciples, you see, the very idea that a Messiah would suffer and die goes against everything they ever believed or been taught as Jews. I mean, nowhere in the Hebrew Bible does it say that the Messiah is going to die. It doesn't say he's going to rise from the dead either. We Christians, you know, we can interpret certain passages of scripture as, as pointing to those things, but, but it's not something that the vast majority of Jews who've ever lived would ever accept, that the Messiah is going to suffer and die and rise again. I mean, far from, it, from enduring suffering, the Messiah is supposed to inflict suffering on the enemies of the Jewish people. That's their understanding. He's going to lead them to absolute victory in a war, establishing an everlasting kingdom of peace and justice and mercy with his dominion stretching from Mount Zion in Jerusalem to the rest of the world. And his followers, this is important, the followers of the Messiah are supposed to enjoy and share in that same power and glory ruling from the temple in Jerusalem. That's how Peter sees the job description of the Messiah. So the instant Jesus insists that he must undergo suffering, rejection, and death, Peter backs away. He rebukes Jesus. We don't know what he says. He tells him off, though. 
And Jesus responds with these harsh and absolutely unforgettable words. What does he say? Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And now, to be clear, Jesus is not saying that Peter himself is the devil. It's just that his preconceived ideas of what a Messiah is supposed to be like are diabolical. They remind Jesus of the time, if you remember earlier on in the Gospels, when he goes out in the wilderness and he is tempted by the devil. And one of the temptations is that if Jesus will just bow down before the devil, the devil will give him all power and glory and honor, ruling from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. But as you know, Jesus refuses that deal since he knows that there's no easy way out when it comes to saving the world. Not for him and not for his disciples either or anyone who follows him. For if anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's unveiling a brand new and totally unexpected vision of who the Messiah is supposed to be. Because Peter, you know, couldn't help, just like any human being, he couldn't help but see the world and his place in it through a particular set of lenses, right? The lenses that had been given to him through his own understanding of scripture or tradition or family or whatever, he saw the world in a particular way, with particular set of lenses. You might say that like any other Jew living at that time, he wore a pair of glasses. They all wore a pair of glasses and they all had the same prescription. But Jesus tells them to take those off. And what happens when you take off a pair of prescription glasses? He can't see. It's blurry. But then you put on a new pair of glasses, maybe with a new prescription, and gradually things start to clear up. That's what Jesus is doing for Peter and the other disciples. And it's shocking at first. I mean, I don't know about you, but when it comes to choosing a religion or somebody I want to follow, I mean, who wants to sign up for suffering? The Quaker theologian Elton Trueblood described this complicating aspect of following Jesus as the Messiah like this. In many areas, the gospel, instead of taking away people's burdens, actually adds to them. And he pointed to the story of John Woolman, who was a very, very successful Quaker businessman in the 18th century, living a very comfortable life until one night he was praying and he was convicted by the Spirit of God that the whole institution of owning other human beings as slaves was against God's will. He was convicted of that. And so what he did is he sold his business, he used all his money, in an effort to free as many slaves as he could. He even started wearing undyed suits to avoid relying on dye that had been produced by slave labor. And this leads Elton Trueblood to write this. Occasionally, we talk of our Christianity as something that solves problems. And there is a sense in which it does. But long before it does so, it increases both the number and the intensity of our problems. Sit with that for a second. That's why following Jesus is hard. It can be really hard. Because it requires all of us to put on a fresh 
pair of prescription glasses maybe many times in our lives. And that new prescription can run counter to how you and I might prefer to see the world and our own place in the world. Because God doesn't care about you or me being absolutely comfortable with our faith. In giving us the spirit of Jesus Christ, God places a holiness within us, a sacred presence that is self-giving, that brings joy and peace and meaning that are far deeper than any mere carefree or prosperous existence. Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms over and over and over in the Gospels that if you want to live an abundant life, you're going to have to think more about loving than being loved. You're going to have to think more about understanding than being understood. More about forgiving than being forgiven. More about giving than getting what you want. Or as C.S. Lewis writes in the last paragraph of his book, Mere Christianity, the principle runs through all life from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose life and it will be saved. Submit to death, the death of ambitions and secret wishes. Keep nothing back. And then the last couple of sentences of the book, he writes, nothing in us that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Now there is obviously way more I can say about this topic, way more than any one sermon about suffering or or what it means to lose your life or give your life in following Jesus. But right now, I just want to make one important point. I want to be clear about something that it doesn't mean to carry a cross. Because people have been told through the centuries that carrying a cross means patiently enduring or putting up with almost any kind of suffering. You probably heard that before. Oh, I'm just carrying my cross whether it's a debilitating disease or an abusive relationship or an oppressive uh, oppression from some figure of authority. Now, certainly God is with us and in us in any suffering that we're going through, and God can use it for redemptive purposes, for healing, for hope, all sorts of things. Suffering in and of, of itself is not irredeemable. But giving your life to Christ is never something that is simply imposed on you. At least in part, it's voluntary. It's the way of the cross, where we take on somebody else's burden, or we abandon our attachment to ego, or we love our neighbor as ourself in the model of Jesus, or as he says, in the, for the sake of Christ or the sake of the gospel. It's not taking the easy way out in meeting the needs of a hurting and often hostile world. And in that sense, it is much harder and much clearer than just saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior or Jesus is the Messiah. Because if you really mean what you say, it's going to show up in your life. It's going to be obvious. A few years ago, actually about, gosh, 25 years ago, I was living in Quito, Ecuador, as some of you know, and my wife and I were living there, and one day, my wife, Margaret, was hundreds of miles away on the coast in Guayaquil, and I was in Quito, and I was by myself, and I got really, really sick. (laughs) Those of you who have spent any time in third world countries or gosh, even our own country recently, and you've gotten really, really sick. You know what I'm talking about. You kind of need somebody to be there to help you out. 
But I had sort of just arrived in country and my Spanish was really not very good. And the only people I knew who could speak any English and maybe help me out were uh, some folks who worshiped at a little trilingual Lutheran church in Quito, little tiny church. They spoke uh, Spanish and English, and since it's Lutheran, they spoke German too. And so I called the office, I'm just really sick. I didn't know what to do. Called the office, left a message. I had no idea if anybody was gonna get that or what would happen. But an hour later, there was a knock at my door and with a spinning head, <laughs> I got up, went to the door, opened it up, and there was the pastor of the church with a bag of groceries in his hands. He came in, sat down with me, he asked me what I needed, he prayed with me, and then he left. And I gotta say, the whole interaction probably didn't take 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> but to this day, to this day, in my memory, that act of responsiveness and kindness somehow saved my life. Now, I don't know if it did literally. I got better in a couple of days anyway. But at that moment, I saw what it means to not just say the right words as a Christian, but to be Christ for somebody else. You know, for thousands of years, all over this world, billions of people have asked the same question in, well, different languages about Jesus. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? And part of the answer certainly could be to say that he is the Messiah, or the Son of God, or your Lord and Savior, or Son of Man, or any number of other things. That could be part of the answer. But if that's where it stops with just labels, it's a distorted vision. Because Christ isn't just a person who walked around a long time ago on this earth doing a lot of really cool stuff. He isn't just a peaceful presence that you have in your heart or a king who's waiting for you to arrive up at hev in heaven. He's alive right now in you. And in me, when we give our love, our energy, even our lives for other people, Christ is in us. Or when somebody else does that for you, Christ Jesus is present. Sometimes in fairly simple acts like bringing over a bag of groceries when you're sick, and sometimes in acts that take great personal sacrifice. So, in Answering Jesus' questions, who do you say that I am? Don't get caught up in getting the words just right. For as the writer Richard Rohr puts it, we do not think ourselves into new ways of living. We live ourselves into new ways of thinking. So let Jesus come alive in you. In love and mercy and grace and healing and let your own life answer the question of who he is. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I would like all of us to be prepared to uh, give an offering in response to the grace, the mercy, the love that you have heard about in God's word. I invite all of us to be generous in supporting the ministry and mission of the Church of Jesus Christ in this particular place.
join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Holy and loving God, your grace is a gift that nothing can match. And the greatest offering we could make is to live according to your will. So grant wings to these gifts that they may soar to do your bidding. Bring a melody to our lips that our days may be songs of praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. and sisters and friends, as you leave this place, as we go on with the rest of this day and the rest of this week and the rest of our lives, take with you whatever sense you have received of God's love, God's grace, God's mercy for you. Take it with you, and as Christ gives you himself, give him to others in how you live your lives as well. Not just with your words. Let your life speak who Jesus is who Christ is. And as you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of you both now and forevermore. Amen.